irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujan Zain, only on LA Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Fujan Zain, and welcome to The Inner Voice Show. This show is about making a difference in your life. Um, the things that happen in your mind, that clutter your mind, um, would like to create a show that would free your mind. And I believe that where your mind is free and clear, your heart starts being filled with love. And um, that's what creates a fulfilling life. A life that you get to enjoy every moment in the present moment. I'll bring you the latest research in the realm of human sciences and we'll talk to experts in their field to bring you the jewel of their knowledge and their wisdom. Um, my latest book, Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to Creating a Life You Want, is um, available. You can get it through Amazon or go to my website at fujan.com, F as in Frank, O-O-J-A-N.com. Awareness Integration Path is the latest psychological model that has been presented in this book, Life Reset, in a series of exercises that you can complete in your own time. Um, the model, the awareness integration model, has been researched uh, in multiple universities and uh, with the different types of people in many different groups. And the last research was in Cal State Long Beach, and uh, we presented that in Harvard. And uh, we found that in um, not in a psychotherapy mode, but in actual um, self-help way, as we were giving the modules to the students, 120 students, in uh, four different classes for a whole semester. And just answering the 12 questions and going through the module, uh, we found 68% decrease in depression and 27% reduction in anxiety. When we've done this in the psychotherapy model in clinical um, settings and offices, we found uh, 73% um, minimization of depression and 63% minimization of anxiety. So um, it seems like it's working uh, for people, whether they do it through self-study and format or they um, do it through psychotherapy models. So um, I hope that you'll be able to get the book and enjoy it and have it uh, work for you. If you also like to consult with me, I have my offices in Beverly Hills, Irvine, and Woodland Hills. And I do a lot of online um, counseling from anywhere in the world or the state. So you can go ahead and um, contact me and go to fujon.com or call me at 818-648-2140. We'll be right back with one of the latest research. But no one is alone 
Holding hands can sync brainwaves, ease pain. That's what a new study by a pain researcher shows, that when romantic partner holds hands with a partner in pain, their brainwaves sink and their pain subsides. This is um, from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and the study was published this week um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences reach for the hand of a loved one in pain and not only will your breathing and heart rate synchronize with theirs your brain wave patterns will couple up too so the study by researchers with the university of colorado boulder and university of haifa um, found that the more empathy a comforting partner feels for a partner in pain the more their brain waves fall into sync and the more those brain waves sink, the more the pain goes away. We have developed a lot of ways to communicate in the modern world, and we have fewer physical interactions. That's why Pavel Goldstein, a postdoctoral pain researcher in the Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience Lab at CU Boulder, stated, and the paper they wrote illustrates the power and the importance of human touch. The study is the latest in a growing body of research exploring the phenomenon known as interpersonal synchronization, in which people um, physiologically mirror the people they're with. It is the first to look at brainwave synchronization in the context of pain and offers new insight into the role of brain-to-brain -brain coupling and may play in touch-induced and angelgia or healing touch. Goldstein came up with the experiment after, during the delivery of his own daughter, he discovered that when he held his wife's hands, it eased her pain. And um, he said that he really wanted to test it out in the lab and to see, uh, can one really decrease pain with touch? And if so, how could you do that? So um, him and his colleagues at University of Haifa recruited 22 heterosexual couples, ages 23 to 32, who had been together for at least one year and put them through several two-minute scenarios as um, EEG cap measured their brainwave activities. 
The scenarios included sitting together, not touching, sitting together, holding hands, and sitting in separate rooms. Then they repeated the scenario as the woman was subjected to mild heat pain on her arm. Merely being in each other's presence, with or without touch, was associated with some brainwave synchronicity in the alpha mu band, a wavelength associated with focused attention. If they held hands while she was in pain, the coupling increased the most. Researchers also found that um, when she was in pain and he couldn't touch her, the coupling of their brain waves diminished. This matched the finding from a previous published paper from the same experiment which was found um, that heart rate and respiratory synchronization disappeared when the male study participant couldn't hold her hand to ease her pain. It appears that pain totally interrupts this interpersonal synchronization between couples and touch brings it back. Subsequent tests um, of the male partner's level of empathy reveal that the more empathic um, he was to her pain, the more their brain wave activity synced. The more synchronized their brains, the more her brain, her pain subsided. Wow. So um, how could this exactly this kind of coupling of brain activity with an empathic partner kill pain? Well, more studies are needed to find that. Um, but him and his co-authors offer a few possible explanations. Empathic touch can make a person feel understood, which in turn, according to previous studies, could activate pain-killing reward mechanisms in the brain. Interpersonal touch may blur the borders between self and other. The study did not explore whether the same effect would occur with same-sex couples or what happens in other kinds of relationships. So the takeaway for now, Pavel says, don't underestimate the power of a handhold. And you may express empathy for a partner's pain, but without touch, it may not fully be communicated. is a city commissioner on the Commission on the Status of Women. She's an Iranian-born American and former Middle East correspondent based on Iran for GMR and Meat in the 1990s. She's the founder of Women Found, as well as the chair of the Pacific Palisades Community Council, vice chair of the West Side Regional Alliance of Councils, and founding chair of the Pacific Palisades Task Force on Homelessness and an elected assembly delegate. In 2016, she was recognized by L.A. County Supervisor Sheila Quill as Volunteer of the Year for the 3rd District and named LAFD Honorary Fire Chief. 
In 2010, Mariam Zar founded Woman Found, a nonprofit dedicated to raising awareness about the plight of women in underdeveloped parts of the world, as well as raising money for charities and foundations that help them. She's a mother of three, as well as a wife, daughter, sister, and a humanitarian. She's active in her community and works closely with local officials on matters of community interest. She's a regular commentator on a wide range of issues. Um, she's also a contributor to the Huffington Post. I know that um, she was supposed to be in the studio, but because of rain in Southern California and Los Angeles, I'm trying to get a hold of her. Uh, in her car. Uh, Mariam, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here, and I think I better move over and speak to you in a way that you can hear me, because I think the rain is probably what you hear most right now. No, we hear you very, very clearly. So it's okay. uh, it's a joy to be able Great. to have you. I'm sorry that you're stuck in 405, which is a uh, tough one. Um, it's a tough freeway to be in, even when uh, it's not raining. But um, it's not raining. Yes, yes. So, Mariam, tell us yeah. about... Well, it's um, a pleasure to be back on your show. Oh, wonderful. It's a pleasure to be back on your show. Sorry. Wonderful to have you. So... Um, I know that you are very active uh, this past uh, year in the political arena, and there's so much that you are doing um, for the community, especially women. So tell us about all that you've been up to. So um, on the women front in Los Angeles in particular, um, I'm working very hard on homelessness. And part of the reason is because women are the fastest growing subset of the homeless population, not just single women, and we can talk about that, but also women who are heads of households. So we're talking about single women who have children with them and experience homelessness. And as you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, there were two ballot measures that we as Angelinos all voted for. In the city of Los Angeles, we voted for HHH. And in the county of Los Angeles, we voted for Measure H. Um, and both of them were basically a tax that Los Angeles residents decided they would be willing to undertake in order to fund housing, right? Not just necessarily homeless housing, but the idea was that we would fund um, the city and the county to be able to increase the housing stock across the city uh, so that there would be more affordable housing available for people. And my um, my objective now is to be able to earmark a good percentage of that specifically for women so that we can help women out of homelessness. And, I mean, Fujian, you and I have had this discussion about the unique uh, circumstances that can leave women very vulnerable, so yes. we can definitely have a discussion about that. But statistically, most women who experience homelessness get to it through trauma. So uh, like something like 60% of them have been traumatized in various forms more than once until they're finally so demoralized and disempowered that they find themselves kind of either on the brink of homelessness or experiencing homelessness. So these people really need a hand and they need a specific set of resources to be able to be empowered again and transition out of homelessness. We also know that statistically when women are given a helping hand, and that's not just here in Los Angeles, around the world this is true, but when women are given a helping hand, they tend to be able to be very effective about taking the help and then uh, continuing um, on a path to success. So homelessness is no different when we're able to give them resources or find them jobs or you know, give them some resources to get through a tough time, we find that women are able to stay out of homelessness you know, statistically at least, more successfully than men. So at the moment, that's my focus. Um, um, and then politically, we can talk about that, too. There are so many women running for public office that we can all probably chip in and help. Yes. Mariam, is the uh, ratio of homelessness uh, rising or in California or um, across the nation, as you know it, or has it been decreased? It is definitely rising in California. We had something like a 20% increase in homelessness in California over the course of the last, I want to say, five years, and we can look at the statistics. There was also an alarming rise in homelessness even in the last year from the last homeless count until now. 
Um, the numbers are staggering, and there's an increasing uh, there are increasing numbers of people out on the streets experiencing homelessness. Some people say that in California it increases more quickly because people come to California from other states because they assume that the weather is better and it's easier to be homeless here. But just even within our own state, within our own city, within our own county, we're increasing our homeless numbers, you know, obviously because, because some of it is just finance, some of it is jobs having a job that pays a living wage, even being able to find a job at a time when the economy maybe isn't all that healthy. Um, you know, there are also issues of mental health. Uh, there's so much that goes into play when it comes to homelessness that you can't really determine why the numbers are increasing, but we know for a fact that the numbers are increasing. And unfortunately, among women, the numbers are increasing faster. That's what uh, was mind-boggling uh, to me also, because that's what, just on a perceptual level, and I wanted to ask you on a factual level, but on a perceptual level, I was yeah. witnessing that it really increases. So it was a different um, uh, uh, concept when you keep hearing that the economy is going better, the uh, there's a lower right. um, econ- you know, unemployment rate, and you're hearing all of that, and you're watching the economy getting better and better, and then yet this on the other side is, um, increasing and it didn't make sense so I was wondering if there are other facts that you have come up um, as uh, you're working about you know with the reason that uh, that could have happened with women I understand that because um, I worked with uh, the domestic violence for almost 17 years working with shelters and oh, uh, right. and um, uh, so we, I saw that domestic violence and the violence at home um, and, you know, for women who were raising their children and did not go into the workforce and then suddenly, um, due to violence, had to be out there, um, right. in, you know, in, in the, on the streets pretty much and not having the ability to get those jobs uh, was definitely one of the reasons. Right. And um, the ratio of um, uh, anxiety and depression and mental mental illness sometimes is also higher for women because of all the pressure that they've gone through. Any other uh, reasons right. that you have um, seen based on the studies and surveys and research that has come up? So everything that you just said is huge and there was so much there that we could unpack. Um, first of all, when it comes to economic data, I agree with you. We all watch this data that talks about how the economy is getting better. But those are, I mean, there's so much that goes into that, right? Those are jobless rates. And the reality is that there are people who are employed who, who have an income. It might not be a career path. It might not have uh, benefits. There might not be a future. It might be a day-to-day, hour-to-hour wage. But there are people who have jobs but still can't afford housing especially in Los Angeles. So one of the one of the groups of homeless people that actually grew in the last year are people who live in their cars. <clears throat> um, they're called vehicle dwellers, right? They're people who spend the night in their cars and they're actually families. There is an alarming number of families who live in their cars. And a lot of those people we have found are people who actually have jobs. But even with the jobs that they have, they're not, they're not able to put a roof over their head. Um, so there are children who sleep in cars and then, you know, wake up in the morning and don't have a place to get dressed or wash their teeth or, you know, brush their hair and still show up at school. Um, so there's a stigma attached to that. And what, what we do when we preside over a society that's willing to let kids sleep in their cars is that we're only increasing their chances of experiencing homelessness when they grow up. Yes. So, you know, it's almost like we're not dealing with what we need to deal with today, hoping we won't have to deal with it a generation down the line, and, you know, sort of closing our eyes to the fact that that's just not going to be true. And Um, what what is the... And then you were talking about domestic violence. So um, I'm on a domestic violence task force, and I'm sure it's not one that you're unfamiliar with. Uh, It's the city attorney's task force on domestic violence. And the connection between domestic violence and homelessness is just undeniable. I mean, I'm sure you can speak to this more than I can. The reality is that if you're a woman who's experiencing abuse at home, you have to, at some point, if you find the courage to walk away, you're going to have to rely on a support system that can give you the resources you need to keep going. And for a lot of these women, even after they work up the courage to be able to walk away from severely abusive situations, 
they find themselves maybe with resources for a, a, a few days, which is what emergency shelter will give you, or a few weeks, let's say, if there's a task force somewhere with some funding to help you. But after that, there's really no housing option. So they're left with the option of going back to the abuser or really facing life on the street. So there again, um, you know, there again, we have to find as a community, as a society, as a city, as a county, you know, however you want to delineate it, maybe as a state with state policies, we have to find a way to give women resources to be able to walk away from abuse, to be able to stand on their own feet, and then to be able to raise a generation that's not likely to experience the same set of problems as adults. Exactly. I remember um, when I worked in um, the domestic violence world, there was a lot of uh, mishaps right in the middle where if you didn't have any money and no resources, there were shelters, transitional housing, and there were, um, you know, f- state money or federal money that would come to you. However, if you had one car, then half of those right. would not come to you. Uh, if you had a job, you right. couldn't just take off and go to a shelter, unknown shelter for, um, you know, one month. And therefore, people who had even just one car, even if that car was three thousand four thousand dollars um they were cut off from all the other sources and uh, this in between right. it was excruciating for women because they did not yeah. fit into any types of categories any that were category. there and right. they would fall so the only way they could go is to go down to complete powerlessness and homelessness and all of it then to be able to get some funding so it was sad that this, the system right. was not set up to raise these women from where they were to the next level so w- right. as you are so in, that's actually go ahead Yeah. No, I was going to say, I have a feeling it was the question you were going to ask. That's something that we're working on on a state level um, to to. So if you think about what homeless, what the homeless situation or even homeless policy is right now, it's it's this realization that there are a lot of homeless people and we have to scramble to find funding to house these people and give them supportive housing. Right. It's you hear it all the time. It's called permanent supportive housing. And what it, what it is, is that we're saying there are all these people who have been homeless for a very long time, chronically homeless, right? And they need a set of support structures around them to hold them up and help them come out of homelessness. So one of the things we're talking about at the state level is exactly what you were just saying, which is to look at the population that can be helped before they're chronically homeless, right? So let's find a mechanism where we can give them jobs that have a forward movement and you know, stable pay, a living wage is kind of what we talk about. Um, Let's find a way to intervene in these people's lives where at that point where what they really need is a little bit of help that can go a long, long way and help them get back on their feet and be able to, to stay away from homelessness versus letting it go until these people have been homeless for such a long time that they need city, state, and county funding to the extent that we're thinking about it now to give them lifelong supportive services which I think applies, like you're saying, especially to women, because there is that moment in time where they really can be helped. And if we had the resources available right then and there to be able to reach out to these women and give them a place to stay versus just a 48 hour shelter, um, you know, mental health services for them and their children before they're completely demoralized and, and don't really want to do life anymore. If we could just intervene, if we could give them two or three months of rent so they could find a place and not be evicted over mi- missing one month of rent, if we could intervene in these m- minor ways compared to what we're contemplating now, um, then we can help these people stay out of homelessness. And, uh, you know, especially when it comes to women, again, we're talking about people who, um, uh, so, I mean, this, this discussion comes up at the city level all the time. Uh, you know, a lot of times disadvantaged women from minority neighborhoods have work, but they don't have careers, right? So they're recruited into jobs where it's daily or it's hourly, but there's no job security and there's no forward movement, right? There's no trajectory to turn it into a career. So something that the city is working on under Mayor Garcetti, who actually puts a lot of focus on on a gender lens. So he insists that the city apparatus look at the, the world through a lens that contemplates gender. Uh, One of the things that they're working on is to make city jobs available to women in ways that weren't really marketed to them before. 
so that we're talking about being able to offer jobs to women where there's benefits, there's safety, there's stability, and there's forward movement so that we can start talking about careers versus just jobs. Um, and in a lot of cases for women who are heading households and they have to raise children and hand them over to society, again, in a way that doesn't repeat the same pattern. Right. Also, Mariam, I think um, what I've noticed when working, um, you know, I've been a therapist for 27 years working with women and especially women who um, are mothers, um, especially women who have uh-huh. been um, into maybe dominant, um, they were raised in a dominant household and then married into right. a, maybe a dominant male dominant uh, household with their husband or even abused. Um, they are innately, naturally have learned how to uh, raise children and do multitasking. But when the, all of that um, dominant support suddenly is taken away or they have to run away or they have to do it on their own, they haven't built the skills of how to be a go-getter, to go out there and fight for right. their you know, career or, or have the ability to transform the skills, amazing skills that they have as a mother to what is going to be out there in finding jobs. And many of them are just maybe in the transition, given some resources such as money, um, just to handle their life. But if they are not counseled or taught in how to shift those p- perspective, they will continue the type of um, um, struggle of a survival struggle, uh, you know, paycheck by paycheck right. or daytime to daytime versus having uh, to learn and somebody to teach them in how to go to the next step for themselves. Have um, any type of uh, type, you know, like a life coaching or uh, career coaching or any of that be also set up for them so that not only the resources are needed, not only the jobs are needed, not only skill building is needed for the jobs, but also shifting their inner culture from being a mom um, and doing such a fantastic job with a couple of kids to now even having to be a career woman. So that's a really good point. In all of the conversations that I've been in, um, this idea of sort of reteaching people how to live once they've transitioned from one, you know, maybe kind of abusive relationship where there was a head, a patriarch, um, to kind of a more independent situation has actually never come up. I think that's a good point, and I will bring it up in conversations that are going forward. I know that there's an effort to lay down a series of vocational training for women to learn new skills, right? Um, So all sorts of skills from coding to, um, you know, the fashion industry is coming back to Los Angeles. Uh, The mayor has put a focus on sort of um, the manufacturing sector that had long left Los Angeles coming back. So there are these skills that women probably already possess. They just have to be honed. Not just women, anybody has them. But uh, the idea that we can teach skills that are marketable and valuable, um, even to people who maybe don't have formal schooling or don't have the luxury of being able to go back to school to learn something new, there, there is a plan in place to give people vocational skills. But the idea that they actually have to learn how to manage, um, you know, on their own, I think is an important and interesting point that I will bring up. Uh, I, I think you yeah. have a point in that. Yeah, you know, I remember. People who grow up in households or in cultures where everything is patriarchal, yeah. uh, sort of have never tested their own management skills yes. as far as just running a household. Yes. I remember um, with one of the transitional housing that I did, I created in Northern California and then in Southern California, we did uh, give them uh, apartments. We get, created child care. We even created job um, uh, training yeah. skills for them. And we created uh, for them to get the um, in the resources from the government until they actually got that. We created all of this. And then yet, to all of right. our surprises, um, these women were not um, were not striving, and some of them kept going back into the mystic um, 
the abusive relationship again. And part of what we were seeing was this the same thing, Marianne, that in their mind, somebody always had to tell them what to do, and they did it beautifully. Yeah. But if if they were going to be out there, it's almost you know like you know you have children, and and um, almost all of our listeners who are listening, you know, a, a person who's going from a high school to now college, and now they have to find a job. It's a different phase of life. That if somebody's not there to hold their right. hand, they get very scared. And usually, if it's just you, right. you can you know rely on somebody. But if it's you with three children. Um, where you feel responsible for them, then you keep going back to the resource that you knew for somebody to tell you what to do right. versus, you know, to be able but to learn that. I, I I think what you're saying is that learning to manage a life is kind of a process. And if you haven't been through the steps, like you said, you know, if you were in a kid and then went to college and then eventually met someone and then got married and did it all, if you didn't go through that process, you kind of don't know how to manage it when it's suddenly suddenly at your feet, you know, overnight when you haven't been through the process of learning how to manage a life. Um, but I will tell you that most of the situations that we've seen have been women who scramble to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so actually one of the ordinances that's in city council right now is the sidewalk vending ordinance. I don't know if you've heard about it, but the whole idea is that in this new economy where like short-term rentals are okay and you know all these all these different ways of making money have entered the economy sidewalk vending of food happens to be one of those new ways so not food trucks they're totally different but singular people who stand on sidewalks with like a cart and maybe sell um i don't know sell you fruit or sandwiches or whatever the case may be um, these have long been illegal, and the city is now looking at an ordinance to try to make them legal. Um, and communities are, are split on this issue, right? Some neighborhoods think it's okay, and some neighborhoods really don't want to see people selling food on their sidewalks. So as we've kind of delved into this thing to figure out who it is that's, that's taking advantage of this money-making opportunity, right, this economic model, we have found that in a lot of cases it happens to be women. Again, you know, first-generation women maybe in the States or economically, traditionally disadvantaged women um, make money in this manner. And yes, yes, it's been illegal. And while it's illegal, it's actually more difficult for them because they can get cited, they can get harassed, right? I mean, they can be taken advantage of in all sorts of ways in order to stay on that little piece of sidewalk to sell the stuff, you know, from their cart. So it's not a pretty picture, but we do find that in a lot of cases, these are women who think to themselves, you know what, I know how to make, um, you know, whatever, jam or a fruit bowl. And so they get on a street corner and they sell it. And shockingly, we've heard from women who have said that they've been able to raise families and even send kids through college um, when they've walked away from a husband or a boyfriend who's been useless for them. And they found a way to pound out life through this you know, through, through this different and new way of making money. So in most cases, and you work with women all the time, so you know this better than anyone else, in most cases, women are really resilient yes. and they step up to the task and they find a way to make it work, especially when they have children. Um, they, they seem to really want to offer a better future to their, uh, to their offspring than they had. And that just seems to be a common theme that everybody works hard towards. That's um, fantastic to hear. Homelessness that. on the part of, yeah, single women who are homeless, you know, again, experience different things. I agree with you. Reverting is easier. But I have found that the people who have kids just have this hope for a better future for the next generation. And that really keeps them working hard. And I, I like it that I'm hearing that when the women are becoming creative, that um, the the city is uh, acknowledging that and trying to help to look at how to make that in a legal perspective where it doesn't kill off their creativity and it gives a system to it yeah. where they can do that appropriately, where it, you know, it becomes a win-win situation for them and the community at large. Um, so that's a great concept yeah. to hear versus just saying no that you can't do that and then but not having any other right. um, appropriate system t for them to even grow um, so tell right. me about I know that yeah. you have done a lot of different um, um, different political um, 
community service in different ways and you are running uh, for political office and how is it uh, different for women to be able to run and um, how much um, more right now we have women who have decided and are determined um, to run for political office? Well, okay. First of all, I should clarify, I am not at this moment running for political office. I want you to. Um, although, <laughs> I, I know, and I was going to say I, I love the, uh, the nod there. Thank you. Um, there was, so, all right, so our city and our county and our state are broken up into districts, right? As you can all imagine, there are districts. So your city has districts, they're small. Your county has districts, they're a little bit bigger. And then your state has districts and they're a little bit bigger. So you have representatives, right? You have elected people who represent you at the city level. You have elected people who represent you at the county level. And then you have elected people who represent you at the, at the state level and then at the federal level, which we're not going to get into. So, um, so I live in Pacific Palisades, which is on the west side of Los Angeles, kind of on the west most northern corner of what's Los Angeles. So as you as you kind of come down, it's Santa Monica. As you go inland, it's Brentwood. And as you go a little bit more inland from that, it's Westwood. And we all know that there's a huge uh, Persian population throughout Brentwood and Westwood. Um, amazingly, Brentwood and Westwood are not in the same assembly district. Uh, they're not even in the same city district, to be honest. So the people who represent, let's say, the Persian population who lives in Westwood are completely different from the people who represent the Persian population, let's say, in Brentwood and over to the ocean, um, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it's true. So um, the assembly district that contains Westwood goes east-west. So the west side of that district is Westwood, and if you go further inland to the east, um, it's a completely different demographic. It's a completely different population, different sorts of neighborhoods, but you're all in the same assembly district and you're represented by the same person over at the state. Now, that district had an opening where the sitting assembly member resigned and, you know, the people in the district needed to elect a new assembly member. And Westwood being in the district, I thought, this is perfect. I'm finally going to get a chance to represent the Persian population um, in state government, which is something that I encourage all of your listeners to do. Um, you know, the Persian community has been very successful at a lot of levels. We've succeeded in business. We've succeeded in education. We've succeeded in um, law and medicine in so many ways. But the one sphere of civic life that we haven't entered into in a very big way has been public policy. So I encourage everyone to keep your eyes out for opportunities to run for public office. But this one was one that I looked at. It was the State Assembly District or uh, Assembly District 54. Um, and as I was looking at it, I realized that there was someone, a woman, actually a, a, a wonderful progressive woman who's already running and she has quite a bit of um, support already lined up, not in the Westwood side of the district, but she does have support. Um, and so I decided I wouldn't run against her. But what I am going to do is help her um, get in touch with the Persian community that would be in her district. Um, her name is Sydney Kamlagar. Um, you know, most Persians don't know her because this is not a part of the district that anyone has ever put any focus on. And I'd like to change that. I'd like to make it so that the, the Persian community that's such a huge part of Westwood starts to come into play when we're talking about policies, especially at the state level, because those are the, you know, those are the broad strokes of policies that affect our lives, not just immediately, but over the course of years, because state, you know, state laws don't change very often. Um, and it's an important part for our voice to definitely be heard. So again, I encourage everybody to start paying attention to your city, state representatives as well as your county representatives. And um, on the other side is also that um, I think sometimes we uh, we feel powerless or hopeless when um, the only yeah. time that we're looking at voting and taking it all serious is, uh, you know, in a four-year election president. where we have to, you know, right. choose a president. But being involved in, uh, in politics and being involved in your community starts um, in 
in these arenas where you are part of uh, choosing and electing the Assembly and the Congress and the Senate and all of those where uh, this is where we can all have a voice and that's not only to wait every four years and then um, feel powerless or powerful only once a year in that sense. I absolutely agree with you, Pujan, and that's so important to realize that, you know, every four years it gets very exciting because the media picks up the race and, you know, it's a nationwide race. We all have something in common when we look at those big presidential races. Um, you know, the ideas that they discuss are kind of big picture ideas and it's exciting to, to think about it and to get involved and debate it at dinners with our family and friends. It's true, we all get involved in those. But the reality is that it's the smaller municipal races that are really impacting your lives on a day-to-day basis, much more substantially than the stuff we talk about in, in you know, broad media terms when it comes to four-year elections for, for the presidency. Um, you know, every single pocket of Los Angeles has a representative at LA City Council. And those representatives are very accessible to people Um, they have an office in the field. So whatever their district is, they have a field office and they have a field representative, at least one, if not more. And it's their job to go out and listen to their constituents. So I would suggest everybody, you know, go online. It's so, it's an, it's as simple as a Google search, figure out who your city council member is and start to interface with them. They're always out in the community. They're usually very easy to access. They love hearing from new people because they hear so many times from the same old people. They really like hearing from new constituents. Certainly the Persian point of view, you know, the Iranian point of view is is important and different and not heard as often as it should be. So it should be very easy for uh, Iranian Americans to be able to get a hold of their city representative and start to tell them what's important to you on a day-to-day basis. You know, we're talking about is your sidewalk clean? We're talking about, do you have a speed bump where you'd like to see a speed bump? We're talking about, you know, are your trees trimmed often enough? Um, You know, we're talking about things that impact your daily lives and you have a city representative that's there to listen to you. So everybody, you know, reach out and see who those people are and, and, and start to interface with them. They're very accessible. And then in that way, you start to get involved with your, with your local government at a level that impacts your life and it's very interesting it's actually probably more interesting than the big presidential elections because it actually impacts your life and then you can start to get involved and see what other ways you can start to have a voice um and i think that what you're talking about i think that you're talking about having a voice i think that um having a voice is just different than um, only having a lot of opinions. I think having important um, right. opinions which have some solid base into reality and that there's some action and there's someone who makes a phone call or goes and talks and creates, um, you know, it's part of the conversation and it's a part of the informed yeah. conversation versus just perceptual um uh, you know, opinions that we give uh, at any dinner table and get all heated up where it might not necessarily lead to anything except getting our family members and f- friends pissed off at each other. Um, so I really right. uh, recommend the same way you are to uh, get involved, get involved in where you can, where you do have some power um, around your own community with the with the representative of your own community. Get to know your representatives where you're voting for them and putting them in the federal offices where they can also be, uh, you know, uh, active and we could do that systematically. Thank you so much, Mariam, Mariam Zar, which um, you are, um, thank you for creating this interview with me, although I know the weather was really, really not helping today. Um, it, it's always a I'm joy. I'm so sorry I wasn't there with you. And no, that's okay. And I, um, and thank you for letting us know that um, the city is helping and hoping to help and creating, um, you know, programs for the homeless and hopefully, you know, uh, let let us know as the community what is it that we can also do to support the homeless and support the city to support the homeless. I definitely will do that. Thank you so much, Bujan, for these opportunities that you give me to come and speak with you. You're always so informed about everything. And also with your viewers, who I'm sure are also informed about everything. 
um, it is it is wonderful for me to have an opportunity to be able to speak to the Persian community, and I'm always talking about you know getting involved and and having a voice. And just like you say, we're all talking about this stuff at dinner tables with our families. And you know, the Iranian community has so many wonderful ideas and great opinions. We're we're so um, involved in the world around us. It would be great if we all sort of begin to understand how we can have that impact uh, within the policy making circles. Yes. Uh, you know, that will impact the future of our lives and the generations that come after us. So Absolutely. thank you so much for this opportunity to chat with you. Thank you, Mary Amjan. And for all of you who are listening, coming from uh, countries that we do not have these opportunities to be able to be a part of um, say, having a say so. I think this is a blessing. I think this is an opportunity and a privilege to be able to do that. And I hope that everyone who's listening uh, takes on this privilege with, uh, with a commitment of ownership and that you create a wonderful life for yourself and everyone around you. Until next week, take good care of yourself. Bye bye. <laughs> You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujran Zain, only on LA Talk Radio.